Welcome back to the Brahmin Word, and uh, I just had an awesome experience with you all walking through the life of Daniel, and somebody else came to my mind that I really wanted to walk through their life and see what we can learn from them uh, as we go through life following Jesus. So, with that being the case, I would love to walk through the life of Noah with you all starting today. Uh, so with that being uh, the case, go to Genesis chapter 6. We are going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 today. Uh, the reason why I love Noah is because of so many different things, as we will see. Uh, but there, that flood passage is fascinating. And there is one thing in there that I don't think we typically think about when it comes to the flood. Uh, but we will get there eventually. Today we are just going to set up uh, the life of Noah and just the situation that is going on with the world uh, that was going on at that time. So uh, with that turn to Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So, uh, that is just the first four verses, and a lot is already happening. Uh, so, there's a couple things here. First, who are the sons of God mentioned in verse 2? There's a couple theories here. So, let's look at those. Uh, one is that they are just very godly individuals at first. Uh, the sons of God are those that believe in God at that time, and then they marry the daughters of man. I think the daughters of man here are just to show that they do not believe in God, uh, that they are just going after worldly things, which then begins to turn the heart of those that believe in God, which we see throughout Scripture, uh, whether it is a man uh, uh, causing the woman to stray or the woman causing the man to stray spiritually. We see this happen a lot in Scripture, so it's no surprise that this happens here. Uh, so that is one possibility. The other possibility, because man is mentioned in verse 1, the idea, the theory, is that the sons of God are actually fallen angels. Um, so we will get on to uh, where Noah is mentioned later in the Bible. There is a place in Second Peter uh, that makes you think that this theory could be the case. Um, that these are just fallen angels that then uh, have relations with uh, the daughters of man and could have been the parents of the Nephilim or the giants. Uh, there is also a theory that the Nephilim were already uh, living at that time as well uh, because they do appear afterwards after the flood. So, uh, because obviously there are giants afterwards like with David and Goliath. So my, my thing with this, just like with the life of Daniel and some of the prophecies that are there, my thing is this. Yes, it's interesting to think about those two theories, which one would be true. I think either one could be true. But for me, it's, okay, just seeing the the straying after God because of the relationships that we put ourselves into. And this is still very true today for believers that believe that they are in a really good spot with God, but then strike up a relationship, whether it's a very good friendship or, um, or a romantic relationship with somebody that does not know God, eventually that could cause them uh, to stray from God. Doesn't mean it will. It's just saying that that is very much a possibility. So this idea is still very, very true today. And so with that, we just need to be 
cognizant or just remind ourselves that, look, even though this person may, may not believe in Jesus, I need to stick by Jesus. And hopefully, during our friendship, during our relationship, there will be an opportunity where I can witness to this individual. Um, that, I think, is what we are saying there. And that's what we should take away uh, from this warning uh, in, in, Genesis, in the first couple of verses of Genesis chapter 6. Then you have the Nephilim as well, and they are giants. My my theory is, uh, I think that they are possible uh, offspring of uh, this relationship, especially if the sons of God are fallen angels. Uh, but I also could see them being around at that time uh, and causing uh, causing chaos, uh, so to speak. Uh, when it's talking about the Nephilim were mighty men who were of old, the men of renown, uh, it seems positive on the surface, uh, but that sadly... Uh, because they were mighty men, men are renowned to a world that was getting more wicked, that's not painting a good picture at all. Uh, then finally in verse 3, when it's talking about the 120 years, um, there is an idea that this is where uh, the 120 year benchmark started. The problem with that, for the max age of people, uh, the problem with that though is that after the flood, people live past this age. So I think that this is more talking about a 120-year time span where God has grace uh, on the human race at this time and does not want to just wipe them out at that very moment. Eventually, he does get to that point where he sends the flood, but for 120 years, he gives them the span of time uh, to repent, uh, to turn from their sin, and to follow after him. But sadly, that does not, uh, that does not happen. Uh, so verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So basically what this is talking about is that uh, there is no repentance. Basically, there, there's no moral backbone. There's no repentance. Nobody's even trying to act in a, in a godly manner or even in a good manner. Uh, there is just wickedness throughout the earth. Um, but then we have verse 6, and this is this is really, really interesting. And sometimes a lot of people will glance this over because it's hard to think about, okay, what is going on here? What does this mean? Uh, but as we've talked about before, we have to talk about difficult parts of Scripture uh, because we believe that it is the Word of God it is real. Well, just like with hard parts of history that did happen, we have to talk about them. And, uh, and so with that, let's look at verse 6. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things, and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. So here is a big question. Can God change his mind? No, seriously, can God change his mind? What we see in scripture is no. God cannot change his mind. Because if God can change his mind, then he cannot be God. Or he would be a, maybe a demigod at best, but there would still be somebody above him uh, that could not change his mind. And so we believe that God cannot change his mind. So what does this mean? Uh, when it says that God uh, regretted that he made man on the earth in verse 6, and then um, that he is sorry for making them in verse 7. Here's a couple ideas. So from what I can see is that when we think about regret, we think about if I had the opportunity to go back to that point, I would have done something differently because um, I made a mistake or I reacted in a way that was a mistake. Um, that is kind of what we're thinking about a lot of the time. For God, it's totally different. 
for God is completely different. When he says that he regrets, that he is sorry uh, for something, it doesn't mean that he will go back or he wishes to go back and do something different. No, he just is reacting to the emotions from the situation that is at hand. And because we live in a world, uh, thankfully, that is based on free will. Uh, these people had a choice, and they had 120 years, too, uh, to repent from their sin, and yet they didn't do it. And so for God to be up there and just to see his children spite him time after time after time, yes, I would totally get into uh, an emotional space of just feeling sorry and just feeling um, just the sense of sadness and and grief, which is what verse 6 says, the end of verse 6, and it grieved him to his heart. So God doesn't change his mind here. He is just reacting in a way that makes a lot of sense, that a father would react uh, when his child does something wrong. It doesn't mean that he regrets for having his child, He uh, that he wants to go back and never have his child. No, he's just saddened by the fact that his child has disobeyed him. We see that, of course, in parenthood. So why could God not be the same way? It doesn't mean that God is not in charge of his emotions, uh, that he is doing so out of spite or out of hate. That is not seen at all in this passage. Instead, we have to see God as both a God of grace and a God of justice. Uh, because in verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That phrase there, found favor, that action there, is could be translated as well, given grace to. And so, yes, you have to have uh, yes, we, we like to think about God being the God of grace because we want to have a God that will always love us and that will always forgive us no matter what. And don't get me wrong, God does love us and God does forgive us, but God is also a God of justice. And really, it makes sense. You cannot have a God of grace without a God of justice. And you cannot have... Uh, and so that makes a ton of sense. And so with that, I think that is what we're seeing in the first part of chapter 6, is that we are seeing the justice of God, but also the grace of God too. He gives them 120 years. And then he does see, instead of wiping them off uh, of the face of, of the planet uh, completely, he gives this one family the chance to start over, uh, to become, again, like a like an Adam, which we will talk about when we get to uh, the Noahic covenant later on between God and Noah. So with that being the case, I think it's interesting to look at um, chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5, uh, verses 28 through 32, uh, which really set up Noah. So when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief or rest from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech, Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years and, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, with Noah and his name meaning this, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, or the fact that we live in a sinful and fallen world, uh, this one, Noah, shall bring us relief or rest from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. This is really interesting because, of course, the big thing that we uh, remember from Noah is that he's the guy that builds the ark to get away from the flood. And so that doesn't seem very peaceful or very restful. Uh, but I think what Lamech is getting at is that because of God's grace that he shows on Noah, he gives humankind another opportunity uh, to 
to strive after being followers of God. I think that is what we see based on the definition of Noah's name. And then, uh, and then we do see a timestamp with Noah too, to think that he was 500 years old uh, when his three children are uh, were born, and then that gives you okay. So he's about 500 years old when we get to Genesis chapter six. That is astounding what he is able to do. Um, and also, it's just it's pretty crazy that he was 500 years old as well. So, but that. Is for another day. That's for another day. So with that, though, this, that gives us context into uh, Noah and the flood. And so with that, we will then see uh, how uh, the announcement that God gives to Noah that the flood is coming and the plan uh, that is then put into place to rescue Noah uh, from that flood and hopefully others. But sadly, only the family of Noah uh, takes that warning to heart. So with that being said, I will see you on Thursday as we continue on with the life of Noah. But thanks for spending a little bit of time with me as we begin the life of Noah. Thanks.